How's everybody doing today? Good, yes. Everybody having a good conference so far? Yeah. All right. How you doing? I'm Chris Condren. I'm an architect with Line Data. We do asset management software. And I've been doing CQRS and event-driven systems for, I don't know, six, seven years now, something like that. And I've built and I've put a bunch into production. And one of the things that I, we're doing now is we're doing a transformation from a very large legacy application into a new CQRS uh, ES-based application. <clears throat> and what I wanted to talk to you today about is why. <laughs> so, you know, I'm trying to, I'm going to take an approach here of why do I do this? Why do I care about it? Why do I love this pattern? How does it make a difference in what we're doing day to day as developers? And there's one piece of the pattern that I often see missed in terms of how you set up your domain services that I'm going to cover in detail. And I'm going to bring that back together and give an overview of the way I generally put together the architecture. And of course, you know, I'm not actually presenting anything new here. You know, everything we do goes all the way back in time, as you're going to see. Speaking about going back in time, this is where I started. I was about 11 years old. I got a TI-94A with Visual Basic, and in about a day I wrote Breakout. And I played that all weekend long, and it was awesome. And I loved it, and I got hooked. And ever since then, I've been trying to get back to that. You get an idea, you code it, it works, it runs, you do what you want to do. But there are things that always seem to get in the way. Version one of the system is always simple, right? And then, next thing you know, it's not quite so simple anymore. Because you have all these interlocking pieces you're trying to get right. And then somebody, wants to make just one more change. And now you're like, well, where do I go to modify this one? You know, how do I not break the speed on this when I'm adding in a new feature? And now I'm not developing and coding and delivering features anymore. Now I'm sitting there for three days, reading the code base to make one one line change to fix the defect that's absolutely got to get out. And we're just not moving anymore. And what I've come to believe is that it boils down to complexity and oftentimes interconnectivity. And I've identified a couple of sources of complexity. And let's talk about one of them right now. I get two components, just like the gears that are working together. Two connections, two things to worry about. Three components, now I have six things, six ways something could go wrong. 18, 28. Just one more feature, just one little thing to add into the code base. And now I, I've got no idea how to make a change here and not break that how to do something, I'm going to spend a lot of time in analysis. Now, this is a bit of a contrived example. We all know there's well-defined solutions for this, the layered architecture, right? You know, this slide represents, you know, something I like to say, I write up on my whiteboard all the time, you know. N plus M factorial is always larger than N factorial plus M factorial. If you contain the complexity in layers, you reduce your overall complexity and connectedness. But with CQRS, and this is what I consider to be important about CQRS, is we can make all those lines one way. Because I've taken and said that my write services are not equal to my read services, I'm not reading and writing to the same thing. Now I have a one-way connection. So my complexity in the system 
has been cut in half in terms of what do I need to understand. When I'm looking at here, I only need to consider what inputs I'm getting and the state I currently have. When I'm in my database, I only need to consider my current state and the inputs. All the way through the system, I've now tremendously simplified what it is I need to worry about at each step. And I can now optimize each one of these for the task at hand. And that's the real benefit of CQRS. Now, the other thing it lets me do is it lets me, lets me use really optimized models, like, for example, event sourcing. But even without event sourcing, I've seen this model work effectively for high performance systems entirely in an Oracle database. Store procedures that write to one set of tables in thermal form, then produce events that go into a transaction table which then update read model tables, which are then run by the application. You don't need to go anywhere else besides just saying I'm going to disconnect and create a pipeline of my state. Now, what I would call this here is accidental complexity. And I call it accidental because we don't really need it because we have options that will achieve the same thing that aren't as complicated. And so as we go through the system, we can pull these things apart. And that's one of the major sources of complexity in application. But there's two other ones in intrinsic. There's our non-functional requirements. You know, we've got to always be up. We've got to have high availability. We've got to be able to recover. We've got to be able to work around the globe in a distributed fashion, right? Throughput, scalability, those things add complexity to the system as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. The last one, and we'll get to that in a minute, is the business process itself in many domains adds a great deal of complexity. But my number one go-to, especially in financial services, for what I call the level zero requirements, is event sourcing. Classic ledger approach to event sourcing. This is uh, from England about 200 years ago. And what I like the most about double entry accounting in particular is it's our first real system for managing distributed ledgers. Because the double entry accounting, I don't know if people are familiar, you've got one set of accounts that you enter and then you enter in another one. The reason that was set up that way originally is fraud protection. Because one set of books was on the ship with the ship captain with all of your wealth sailing to India, and the other set was back in the home office. And the trial balance you achieved in that scenario was what you did to see whether or not he had ripped you off while he was away with all your money and all your goods for six months. And as soon as you have multiple ships and multiple investors, bringing that all together, I've got a complete record of everything that happened. I don't forget anything, because that's another thing I see in systems a lot, is people are backtracking and having conditional logic for things that they just forgot to remember as they process through the system. So I've got a complete audit log. I've got something which will strive to distributed in placements, and I can always reconcile it. The other thing we want is long-term durability immutable. This, what I call blockchain version zero, this is a Mesopotamian grain audit in clay from 7,000 years ago. It's right once media. 7,000 years later, I can still tell that six urns of barley were delivered to the warehouse, right? We can still read this event today. Nobody is available to translate it for. It's still there. So 
The other thing which I like is a more modern example of event sourcing, which as I think I saw, I don't know if he's in here, in the Wix talk yesterday, you know, relational database is a projection over the transaction log of a database. Oracle on the left here, SQL Server on the right. It allows you to go back, it allows you to produce state, it's fast, it's durable, it performs. So the reason to use event sourcing in my mind is to provide these durable transactions that allow you to easily solve problems like cache immutability, or cache invalidation, solve distribution, bring things back together in a durable and repeatable way. So I want to go back and get into our last main source that I'm going to be talking about here, and that is, and this is where I'm going to spend most of the, the time, is back into the domain and how to set up your services. And I'm going to start back with that program I wrote to do breakout. So I actually went online and I found the manual for the coding language that I wrote back in 1981 or so to write that breakout program. And as you see, it was basic with line numbers. And there's four loops and there's go-to lines. And I love the fact that the go-to here points to the wrong line. <laughs> Should actually be going back to 160 and not 140. And this program makes this character dance. So the override of character, they put it up on the screen. And by switching back and forth, you can make it dance. And this is the grid that you put all the characters on. So when I wrote that breakout game, I created a line here and a line here right in the video memory of colored characters and a series of bricks on the top and a paddle. And I had one ball that moved up and down and back and forth. And I used the, the wonderful new go sub approach, which allowed me to jump down to a particular line and then return to where I was to build a control loop. And when I look at that control loop that I built, and I just had one main loop, it just looped through the whole program, we get started and it just keeps going until you lose the game. And I look and see whether or not you're pressing the left or right key. And if you are, I move the paddle. And what I did to save space and time was I actually just updated main memory for the screen directly. Right? So when the panel moved, I would just write over things. And then when I was moving the ball, I would have all eight directions laid out. If you're trying to move in one direction or another, it would see if the square was empty. So it was actually using the color of the memory here to determine whether or not it hit a wall. And if I hit a wall, I then turn around and start going the other way. Or if the bricks were a different color. And if I hit a brick, then I would erase the brick and then keep moving. Now, this is my first program. I had some bugs in it. Can you see what the fundamental problem with trying to debug this would be? I'll tell you what happened was I was playing it, and I would get to a certain point in the game, and it would shut off. Just done. I didn't even get an error message. Right? And I finally walked through and found a breakpoint, and I realized that if we go back to this grid, I was trying to write to memory outside of the array. Because in this loop here, when I moved the paddle over to the wall, I had an off by one error, and I erased the wall. So when the ball came over and hit that spot, there was no wall, there was no color for it to stop. And it just went right off the screen. And the fundamental problem here is that everybody is talking, reading and writing, to memory directly. And so when something goes wrong, I don't know why, I don't know where, I don't have a log. I can't tell what happened. 
I had to literally sit down and figure it out from logic. And to make things a little bit more complicated, I had to go back to my notes because this first computer didn't have a hard drive. So I literally wrote out the programs on a notebook and then typed them all in, which is probably where my off by one error came from. All right? Here's how I fixed it. I just had one function that checked before you wrote to main memory whether or not it was a wall. And it said, you can't erase the walls. And everything moved on. And I didn't really think about this you know, in my programming career as a sort of a great insight. But in truth, this one step here that says you can't get to modifying state unless you've gone through one controlled point where I can enforce invariance, check things, is actually really, really important. Because if we look at this, I can decompose this into two top-level command handlers that are changing what today in the main we call, might call aggregates, that are then being aggregated together into what you could call a process manager, which then updates the main state of the program. And you want to do that today because of the same reasons we have here. It's easier to understand. I can reason about it really well. I can tell what happened. Because if you've ever had to debug a problem in a giant relational database on, on a production system quickly, and you don't have a real audit log of what happened, you'll know the ability to do that in your development work day to day on any size system is incredibly important. So let's talk about this in a slightly different scenario. I've got my event source system. I've got three services. At this point, I really don't care where they're running. I don't care if they're individual threads in a single console app or microservices up in AWS. But what I have said is that we have Amanda and we have Josh, and they're married. And they each have a personal calendar, and they have a family share calendar. And let's talk about what happens with a very simple collision, right? If I say that Amanda is a finite state machine that's event-driven, and I've got all the events, and I know that her calendar is free at 8 o'clock, when a friend requests a dinner reservation at 8, she can say yes, sure, all right? And Josh because there's no, connecting, no connection here, can do the same thing. Let's say that Amanda is a little bit faster than Josh, because we're just going to use arrival times on the messages to determine when things happen. That event is going to be picked up by the shared calendar, which is watching both of these, and say, oh, OK, I'm now busy at 8, and it's going to emit an event says in business eight. Meanwhile, Josh has accepted a movie at the same time. And then we come down here to the family calendar. In this particular variation of the model, because each of these own their own state and are guaranteed to be atomic, the way to handle this is for this to raise a conflict event and report back to both of those two systems that something went wrong. And now they're going to need to figure out in the business space what happened here. Now, what I've done here and why I think this is important is I've said that the conflict resolution is not a technical problem. If you're saying that Amanda and Josh have their individual calendars, and they can accept invites without checking, then this can happen. And you need to have a process to explain to me as a developer how I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to model that in the event stream. Yeah? Uh, shouldn't uh, the family conflict be only reported to John? Because right now, there are two all 
like two persons trying to uh, resolve that conflict, and they can uh, like stumble upon different um, strategies. Uh, different so, so the question is, should this only go to Josh? In truth, the family conflict here is going to be publicly broadcast, and it's going to in this scenario is going to include both of them. Now, because they've both been able to commit, in this scenario, they both need to know they have to resolve it. So most likely, that's going to be resolved with a communication between the two of them, right? Okay, so now, it, it depends how you uh, like right. deal with the first event. Exactly. Because, for example, we could say that Amanda can accept appointments and put them on the calendar, but Josh has to check. This is how my family works. <laughs> Right? So here, this aggregate gets the command in, but it's actually going to try and get this aggregate or this event processor to commit to that of being open prior to accepting that state change. So we're a different way to run the business logic. So the point here is that what we're looking to do is to define a number of small grained items to deal with the business problems in a way that we can simply and readily understand, reason about, write comprehensive tests about, and surface back to the business, back to the domain experts, the conflict resolution, the conflicts and the problems. There are a number of ways that we could attempt to automatically resolve this, or resolve this with the minimum amount of fuss. What we need to say is, what's the correct way for this domain to resolve this problem while we maintain our history? Because what we want is we want to be able to create, oh, event services that we can run as atomic modules, right? I want to be able to have something that I know control state, updates it in a nice single-threaded way, only takes in an event history, only commits out an event history. It is the single authority for anything that happens there. Now, if I make those too big, I can't distribute my system, right? If I have one giant monolith and it's responsible for everything, I can only have one of them. What I really want is a nice, very fine-grained set of responsible entities. Now, I can also run them hot-hot, because I can say, if I get a version mismatch, right, when I go back to commit, if I get an event history, and I'm at version 7, and I try to commit, and the repository says, well, you're version 8, well, I'm not going to accept your changes, because you violated the constraint that all history must be sequential. Now, you can then retry. You can do all sorts of resolutions that all go back to the business problem at hand of how do I deal with these multiple updates and multiple commits, right? And these get composed together to create greater and greater elements of state. And because we have the history and we have the causation history of exactly where we're at, we effectively have vector clocks on the state of the entire domain. Does that answer your question? Yep. So, and I missed, uh, and so I was saying here, probably the next step that's gonna happen here is that Josh is gonna, gonna confirm, because at this point he knows he's got dinner at eight, and this model will get an event out saying that Josh confirmed because you can't change the state of the shared calendar without an event. So here I'm saying the calendar's busy at eight, but it's unconfirmed. And then we get a, a positive confirmation from both people. Doing a full two-phase commit on that one particular entity. Now both approaches are completely fine. Do I want to let things run independently and have something which will try and resolve them? Because there's no actually rule here that everybody has to go to dinner or everybody has to go to the movies. 
Because they can both decide to go separate ways. It depends on the business problem at hand. But the key here is divided up into small, reproducible pieces of functionality that you can understand and test simply. How do you do that? So we've talked about CRS, creating that singular flow through the system to reduce complexity. We've talked about event sourcing to deal with a lot of our complexity of non-functional requirements. And now I've talked about an approach to break down the domain, but you can't break down that domain without understanding the business. So in my experience, that's the main reason to use domain-driven design is to find your bounded contexts for what's going on. This is a transit map of Boston, right? And what I find most times when people are trying to build their services and they're making them too big is they're trying to take two or more bounded contexts or zones and fold them into the same area. Because this map of Boston and this map of Boston are entirely different. And that's the easy one. Can anybody spot the difference between this map and this one? So this in here, very easy. These are the ones where I've got two domains that are very close to each other, but actually do different things is where you really need to watch out for. And if you look down here, you'll see that on this map, Dudley Square, Mission Hill, and all the neighborhoods are listed. And if I go up here, I can find Dudley Square, and I know how to get there. But if I go back down to the street map, it's gone. So if I'm trying to resolve that with a single service, I've got to say, well, if it's on the map, or if it's not on the map, or I have to reach out to someplace else, then that's gonna prevent me from being able to create the isolated services. So whenever I cannot create those isolated services, I've found a business question I haven't answered or a bounded context I haven't identified. So let's talk about what this means in practice for us as we're walking through actually making this change to go from this theoretical idea to something on the ground in production. We've got our classic three-tier application. We have a client, multiple middle tiers, database clusters. And the first thing that we did, starting back before I even joined, was we divided the middle tier into business logic and a caching layer to improve performance as we distribute it. The next thing that happened was we saw a proliferation of different UI elements. So now we have a desktop client, a mobile client, web clients all being built out. Here's where we begin to do the transformation between this three-tiered app into the event services. All we do is we take the middle tier and we split it. And now these domain services are now microservices running side by side with the traditional, um, so this is actually divided in half here. So you'll see some domain services being run as traditional and then some as uh, microservices that are now reporting into a write store, which is the event store. And then we keep the entirety of the legacy UI in the caching and the legacy database intact. And this just becomes another read model appended on to the new event store. And as we do that, we're dividing this into multiple different top level domains. Each one taking over a piece of functionality one by one. We then isolated the store procedures that uh, updated the database and redirected those to the domain services to update streams in the event store and then update into separate reporting, history, and transactional database instances. 
still updating the same cache and the same user interface. Any questions on this point? <coughs> so I just want to talk a little bit about one of the things I think people have trouble with figuring out when to use this pattern, when to not use it. So I bring out this diagram I call my fish diagram all the time. And this is my supposition on the nature of the world in my experience to date. And what I'm saying here is that for low level of complexity systems, a CRUD or a classic approach is far easier and will be intermittent much faster. And if you know that your complexity of your system isn't going to keep on growing, then you're not going to wind up Come on, I can do this here, right? You're not going to have hundreds of different nodes talking to each other, complicated business problems, then you probably don't need to go to the rigor of identifying how to build all these atomic services, right? But if you do take that jump and go up the curve, what you're going to see is that your complexity is going to remain roughly equal and grow slowly over time. Because every one of the services you build, because you've externalized your state, you can now test it completely and thoroughly and compose tested pieces of components together. And if I've tested every input and every output that's valid for a service and proven it doesn't give any side effects because it's one narrow slice, that I can effectively not care about its inclusion because I know it's correct and I know when it's going to break. One of the first systems I built that I event sourced, and because I've heard talking a little bit about the CRUD applications here, in my experience also, once you've gotten your team over the hump and into being able to build event source systems, it's actually easier to build just about everything in the same way. And there's some, a lot of good reasons to do it. So the first application I built for production was a peer review system built in Outlook. And it was very simple. You whitelisted or blacklisted clients. And if one of the employees on your team sent an email to a client, it automatically took that email, routed it to a peer. And if they reviewed it and the information was correct, then it would seamlessly go on to the client. And everybody loved it because it saved a whole bunch of time with printing things out and you know, manually emailing to somebody and getting it back and things getting slipped and screwed up. It's in production for about a week. And I got a call from a senior VP. And she wanted me to explain why we just had a breach where one of her people had sent an email to a client with the wrong account information. And my system hadn't caught it. Now, I had gone through and I had actually event sourced the configuration, the whitelisting and blacklisting of the emails and the team setup. And so I opened up the system and I rolled back through the events. I said, oh, well, that client you whitelisted is not needing review last Thursday at 4.45 PM. Would you like me to fix that for you right now? And she just said, um, OK, thank you. And I said, thank you very much. That's all set now. So even systems that are normally considered to be better to be CRUD-based, if you have any reason to need any of those non-functional requirements, history, audits, it's far easier to create the system in an event source manner. I've also heard a lot of people talk about the overhead of all the events and the work of having to create an event and then create a read model and do this and do that. What I found is as the complexity of what you're doing goes down and the clarity of your intent goes up, you can write what needs to be done much faster. If I know what I'm doing 
and I know the context I'm in, I can produce the event for something in 30 seconds of typing. And then when I write the view model for a screen, if that model matches the screen exactly, I know exactly how to create it. I'm not trying to figure out, well, is this right, or how do I do this, or how do I do that? So my clarity on what the system is doing and what it needs to do next is very, very high, and my productivity goes through the roof, even if I write a little bit more code. And what I find is you don't write your audit schema. You don't write your history schema. You don't write reconciliation systems that will automatically reconcile two databases because you've asked the business what to do in each case. So the system handles all of these things explicitly. And so that little bit of extra time you have specifying what you want to do is greatly offset by what you're not doing. And the easiest feature in the world to upgrade, update, and ship is the one you didn't write. So, and I've added a couple of, um, these slides are going to be available on the web. And I've added a couple of formal definitions here of the system as a whole. But I'm not going to bother reading them. I'll leave them up here for people for a second if you want to read through them. All right, questions? Yes? Like right. So the question is, if I'm getting this right, is you've got a, a system with a number of microservices. They're all event sourced. They're all participating. And you want to add a new microservice, and it doesn't require any audit history. Would it be all right to implement that microservice in a CRUD-based fashion? So um, I would say yes, but I wouldn't. Um, my problem with the, one of the things that I am looking for here, if we take a look at one of the things that happens here as we have these services, is I've divided the world into two different groups of problems. I've got internal problems. This service only considers the events and the messages that it handles, and it makes decisions internally. And then the second thing I've got is I've got use cases that are implemented across services, and those use cases are only defined in terms of message flow. And they're not defined in terms of which services are handling them. So as soon as you don't have this strong boundary that the services you're loading only need effectively access to an event store in a queue, you've started coupling them to other things. And you've started increasing your internal state in the services. And as soon as you do that, you lose track of the guarantees of the testability. So now, if you wanted to have another service in here that didn't need any storage, that could be done. So if you have a service that's doing complex event processing and is going to watch the stream of events and produce commands to be acted on, you can implement that without any storage, right? There is no history or produced events. It just issues commands back out on the bus. But as soon as you're saying you want to have that service be crud like it's attached to a database, now, if that's outside of your domain, that's also fine. So does that answer your question? Other questions? Any tips uh, for uh, how to version 
information on aggregates or, or what, whatever is uh, dealing with those uh, events in a sure. distributed system and where you uh, might want to uh, like scale this component to several instances. Okay, so how do you version components and events in a distributed system where you have multi might have multiple consumers? Right. So uh, the first thing is I, I always assume that I need to be able to run multiple versions of the service at the same time in production. Because normally what I'll do is I'll run multiple hot, hot copies of the same service and I'll cut in a new version while the old ones are running. So as soon as you make the sort of fizz loss, you know, the step in your head that you're going to be running them both at the same time, and this isn't a turn it off cutover, then that clarifies your decisions by reducing the boundaries and what you can do. Yeah, but so, this, uh, like, um, that is um, running in multiple instances, for example, yep. is a given, uh, then what kind of uh, tips you have? Well, well, that's what we're going to do now. All right. So, the first thing you do is I constrain the problem to say it's got to run hot, hot with different versions. So that means that my messages need to be interpreted by the different versions at the same time. So I go with an extend only model on the messages. And if a message is different enough that extend only doesn't work, then it's a new message and I create a new message and I leave the old message alone. And so services know how to handle the old and the new message and they'll prefer and produce the new one instead of the old one. Additionally, I use a weekly type schema like JSON, so I can seamlessly add fields to it, and I give those fields to vaults. And I put the translator, I put the logic of how to upcast an old event into a new event in the deserializer, so that my new state machine isn't concerned with how to upcast an event from version one, two, or three, it's always going to see a version three event. So the old version of the service will see a version two if it's version two. But the deserializer will upcast that, fill in the defaults if it's a version two event into a version three event, which is then processed by the system. So that's why here I'm saying that it's single sort authority, single threaded, inversioned. So the causation history here is a guaranteed incrementing version number on every message that's produced. The way I do that is I use the event store. Because if I say that this is going to commit to a single name stream in the event store, every append to that stream is guaranteed to get a unique incrementing number attached to it. And then I use the clustering in the event store to guarantee that that is distributed across either a general or geographical region. And if you don't use the event store, uh, like, because uh if it's running in a single threaded, like there is one, one, one cons uh, component that guarantees this or ordering and, right. and distributed system, like e each time you uh, basically um, publish an, an event, uh, like uh, if the state chain changes, there you always have to communicate with this uh, one. Uh, so, uh, you're, you're you're so you're talking about replication in a cluster. Uh, so I'm about uh, performance imp implications, uh, and uh, if those um, performance implications are really a problem. Uh, so they're not, because I'll either do it, I'll either use, my approach in practice is either use a SQL database to guarantee that with a cluster, SQL, Oracle, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter which. Find a clustered storage system that can guarantee you that and use that to enforce your guarantees, rather than rebuilding that in your application. So separate your application logic from your distribution problems. And if you use something other than uh, RDBS, uh, 
EMS because uh, in those systems, this is a given. In uh, NoSQL uh, <laughs> yep. databases, this is part that you uh, usually will have to like provide on your own. I don't do that because then you're taking into your business domain a problem that's well known and well solved by very smart people. <laughs> so you can use that system just to keep track of your sequence IDs in your events and then have a graph database or have a document database as a downstream from that store and just have a chain of outputs. So that goes back to the CQRS in creating the stream of event changes. The only place that we're saying we need to have these atomic clocks is in the business domain and its primary storage. All of the other systems can then use the vector clock that that provides. Because as soon as I have a number of streams with a guaranteed causal history, I have a set of vector clocks. Once I have the vector clocks, then I know whether or not I'm current or whether or not I've missed a message in my downstream systems. And that all greatly simplifies as I build it out. Yeah, so that I don't try and solve it in, in the business logic. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. So, right. right, so if you have a bad event in the system, how do you correct it? Um, so if you have a fully ma mangled event, you know, I'll, um, something which is not processable, then I might do something along the lines of creating a, a uh, checkpoint or a snapshot at the point right after the correction so the system never has to go back and read that event and leave it there. Or I might do a correction where I reproject the entire aggregate into a new stream if it's really screwed up. But then I just do reversing transactions. Because what you have to do is when you're talking to the business people, you say, when errors occur, how do we recover, right? What is the process for doing a reversal? And that reversal process applies to coding errors as well as human errors. So that would just be a, and then the other thing I do is whenever I'm doing that sort of logic, I always make sure that in the event stream, I include the audit trace of the source event and the version of the aggregate the source event is from. Right, because that allows you to tell as you roll back in time why a particular action was taken. Um, one of the classic examples there is answering the question of if you have a problem in your core data that has healed itself, but a side effect has already continued on and produced downstream effects, how do you roll back and identify what happened? You know, for example, I've also gotten the question when you look at. Uh, what we're building out, we're building out a master data system. And people say, well, master data, that seems to be, master data is your general view of the market or the securities in the market, you know, for the day. People say, that's a very CRUD-like app. Why don't you build that as a CRUD app? And the problem is, if you build it as a CRUD app and not as event sourced, when you have a vendor that miscategorizes say, IBM, to not be a large cap stock, but to be a mid, uh, mid cap or small cap stock at 10 a.m. and your rebalancer picks that up and you sell all of the IBM in a portfolio because it's the wrong type of stock, but at noon it gets fixed. Now, if that's a credit database, there's no record that at 10.35 when you started the process, this is what we thought it was. So in when you're doing an event sourced uh, approach to that to a CRUD-based operation, generally you're just saving the deltas. You increment your versions, you save your deltas, and you present your data as a snapshot 
to your external consumers. But when you have to roll back time, everything is still there. Does that help? All right. So is that clear as mud or is that... Uh, so it takes a little bit of extra work to get down to those atomic services, but it forces you to fully understand the business problem, to get the business to fully understand the problem and talk about the edge cases they haven't. And it should simplify everything you're doing so you can move lightning fast when you're actually doing your coding. And I just want to thank James Nugent and Greg Young as the people that introduced me to this madness. This is my, uh, all the errors and what I've said are mine. Everything I was right is clearly, well, it's probably not theirs either. You have to go back to, I don't know who. <laughs> so we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. None of this stuff is new. As I said, blockchain was invented 7,000 years ago in Mesopotamia with clay tablets and wooden sticks. <laughs> Thank you all very much.